I want to welcome you to the third event in this Perspectives on the Digital Humanities series. Um, this series is hosted by a working group in the Research Center in partnership with the College of Arts and Sciences, the Library, and the Department of English. Um, tonight's speaker is Simon Tanner, founding director of King's College London's Digital Consultancy Services and a faculty member in the King's College Department of Digital Humanities. As some of you know, King's College offers an undergraduate program of study in digital humanities and three master's degrees, an MA in digital humanities, an MA in digital culture and society, and an MA in digital asset management, which Simon actually directs. It also boasts the first PhD program in digital humanities. I think nobody else has tried you for that. Yeah, I think you can claim that title. Um, its faculty and students are involved in an extraordinarily diverse set of digital research projects spanning subject disciplines which include and frequently cross boundaries between ancient, medieval, and early modern history, classics, literary studies and linguistics, drama and performance, religious studies, art history, and here's the page turn problem with my two mic. <laughs> art history and architecture, music and musicology, and increasingly, the social sciences. Many of these projects are funded by major funding agencies and foundations, like the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is the UK equivalent of the NEH, the Leverhulme Trust Foundation, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. All of them are highly collaborative in nature and involve partnerships across disciplines, institutions, and national and international boundaries. Simon Tanner himself has worked recently on an Arabic manuscript cataloging project with the Wellcome Library and Egypt's Bibliotheca Alexandrina. He's partnered with faculty at Birmingham Center University on a project about the benefits of digitized resources and he's worked on a project about li library image management and search systems for the Bridgman Art Library. He led the technical implementation and planning process for Parker on the Web, an interactive web-based workspace design designed to support the use and study of the old English and medieval manuscripts and early printed books in the historic Parker Library at Corpus Christi College. Cambridge. Uh, this is funded by Mellon and Corpus Christi and Stanford University. Fabulous project. Um, again, a page turn. The title of his talk has baffled everybody. <laughs> um, is it measuring the impact of the digital for the humanities, the possibilities of a balanced value model? Please join me in welcoming, well, bleh, welcoming him to the University of Delaware. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Anne, for that very generous uh, introduction. And I have to say it's a real honor to be here at the university and to be speaking in this particular room at this time of the year when we're thinking about veterans. Um, so thank you very much for having me here and speaking to you uh, today. Now, um, I'm going to range widely. Uh, this is my agenda uh, for this talk. So I'm going to sort of dip into a number of different uh, areas a smorgasbord of digital humanities, shall we say, um, because I wanted to talk a little bit about digital humanities at King's um, and my perspective on, on what it is and what it offers, particularly in relationship to the relationship between memory organizations and digital humanities ac academics uh, in particular. I wanted to talk about the results of the research that I did for the JISC funding body in the UK on the benefits and value of digital resources uh, for digital humanities and digital humanities, and also to introduce a, uh, an attempt to shift our perspectives on impact uh, with the balanced value impact model. And I think this presents some interesting challenges to us uh, as humanities scholars and, and particularly to the digital humanities. And amongst that, I'd also like to talk about cultural value, which comes out of the balanced value model as well, in relationship to this thing called the, the midnight run. And I'll talk more about the midnight run uh, later on in, the, uh, in my presentation. But I wanted to start off uh, with uh, a video, because that's always a fun way to start a, a presentation. So a very short sort of one-minute 
uh, video of, of uh, one of the midnight runs. So the midnight run is something, is, a, uh, is an activity that I'm engaging with as a scholar, but I'm working with uh, two uh, arts organizations or artists. Uh, one is an artist and performer, Inua Ellums, and the other is uh, director of the Entelechi Arts organization, uh, David Slater, who, uh, and what they do is work with uh, the elderly and the vulnerable. And the first one I'm going to show you is the first midnight run, and the idea of this is it's like a 12-hour flash mob. Uh, and the way that works is, is that we invite everyone to, to come to a particular place at 6 p.m. on a particular day, and then we take Inua leads us on a journey through London for 12 hours until 6 a.m. in the morning. And the motto of the Midnight Run is, because we can't see stars for fumes, we turn to smash glass, believing shards shine like constellations do. run and the reason I wanted to show that to you in particular is because it is my firm belief that the, that the humanities and the digital humanities in particular uh, has to be uh, bedded in uh, people's lives and we have to be always considering uh, the people in the process as opposed to just assuming that we're only doing this for ourselves in the academy. And so not everything that the digital humanities does has to have digital in it also in that perspective. But there are some unique aspects to uh, the digital humanities which we can bring to these relationships in terms of collaboration, in terms of crossing disciplinary uh, boundaries, and things that I know are um, uh, close to your hearts here at Delaware as well. Um, so briefly, about, so I'll come back to that in a bit in terms of how that works, but briefly the Digital Humanities at King's College London is a combination of research activity, teaching activity and, and innovation activity. And we are involved in a number of uh, collaborative research projects at any given time, uh, working on using the application of technology in the arts and humanities and social sciences to enable us to engage with different research questions. And we have the three master's programs, which, as Anne mentioned before, digital asset management, digital humanities, and digital culture and society. And we're in the process of designing a new uh, undergraduate program called Digital Culture. And we have innovative partnerships with over 500 projects uh, over the years and 20 countries, and uh, that's uh, reflecting uh, an arm of, of, of income that comes in, which is not just about research income or, or, or teaching income, but it's also about consultancy. Uh, it's about the expertise and knowledge transfer of our expertise out into the community of museums, libraries, and archives around the world. So that includes things like, you know, working on the digitization of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's working with museums and libraries on digital strategy. It's working at national and international levels on, uh, on standards and those sorts of activities as well. So to talk a little bit about scholarship and digital scholarship, um, I think it's important to 
go back to some first principles, really, as expressed by John Unsworth's scholarly primitives, when he talked about scholarship being involving, discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing. And, of course, there could be other uh, aspects that we would add into, uh, into, into this mix. And the suggestion that all of these are part of the, uh, the field of humanities scholarship, and they're also within the remit of uh, digital humanities as well. And now we're seeing these sorts of activities represented by the sorts of activities that people are doing online. When we look at online behaviours, you'll see all of these behaviours represented. And so to a certain extent, what we're seeing is that scholarship is, if you like, the rarefied, condensed um, aspect of that ape brain requirement to be curious and to discover and to make things uh, in that sense. And where digital scholarship fits into this is not that we're remaking or we're doing new scholarship in terms of all those things. We're not, we're not suddenly saying that, oh, because we're doing digital annotation, that's new scholarship that's never been done before. What we're saying is, is that by working in a digital environment, we're enabling some fairly interesting things such as the opportunity to be interdisciplinary, to cross disciplinary boundaries, and I'll show examples of this as we, as we go through. To find new methods and to ask new questions, or to ask questions in ways that maybe weren't practical previously in our, in our approaches. And that means that we're able to bring in many sources, many more primary sources into our research than potentially we could before. You know, that idea that... Um, uh, we can engage with uh, many, many more literary sources than we would have done previously because of their availability in digital environments. And that the things that we create out of our digital source, out of our digital scholarship, are going to have many uses and many audiences that we may not have expected previously. Um, you know, our expectations of our audiences may be that if we've written our scholarly book and it's a real hit, it's going to be read by three, four hundred scholars around the world, you know, along those lines. Uh, and we're suddenly finding that the same is not true of our, of our digital outputs, that they're being read and engaged with by all sorts of people that we probably didn't think about or necessarily didn't have the expectation at the beginning of the activity. And the other element here, which is worth stating is that things have moved on from the 1990s where, and the early 2000s where technology was driving scholarship to a certain extent. We were being driven by the if we build it, they will come mentality. We were being driven by the, oh, isn't this cool technology? Wouldn't you like to fund us because it's cool technology? Now, what I would suggest is, is that scholarship first, technology second that when we think about this environment, we should be thinking, what am I wanting to do as a scholar? How does the technology enable me to do what I want to do as a scholar? Not, oh, let's do technology, now let's make my scholarship fit the technology. And so we should be looking at digital scholarship as an enabler as opposed to a disruptive technology in that sense. And there's a number of things, a number of activities... Um, and I just wanted to, to re-emphasize that the thing that's gluing all of this together is collaboration. And that's the thing that's re that I think is really different about the sort of activities that I'm doing and that others are doing in this space, is that it's about working with others. It's about working with people who aren't scholars, and it's about working with other scholars in other disciplines. And it's about that uncomfortable expression of sitting together and finding the areas where you can work together and finding the points of contact between the detailed scholarly knowledge that's required to work in these digital information spaces, maybe to work in areas such as 3D visualization or to work in areas um, such as uh, georeferencing, and to find the points of contact between that and, say, a classics scholar perspective or a linguistic scholar perspective, and to make those work together for everyone's benefit. And within that context, a lot of the time, when we're collaborating, we're collaborating with memory institutions. So we're collaborating with libraries or museums or archives, those holders of cultural memory in some respects, maybe even publishers or, or media organizations. And I think that there's an element here in terms of 
where does that, that, that collaboration go in terms of the relationship between the memory organizations and the academy and the levels of, of collaboration? And I think that there's a lot of things that museums, libraries, and archives will need to do for themselves, represented by these, 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 these blue squares in terms of they've got to get their own uh, handle on digital preservation. A scholar can't do that for them. They've got to organize those things. They'll need to build their own internal skills and experiences and develop their collections. These are what they're there for. But there's this interface layer, which is the green area, where if we as the academy can engage with uh, memory organizations, then we can work in a very collaborative way to build communities, to build strategic relationships which are about digital scholarship, but also about digitization strategies, which is very much going to, again, sit in the remit of the memory organization along those lines. Because there are things that scholars can do that are maybe sometimes more difficult uh, and that is obviously the research project. Right up there is the aspect where you're going to be assuming that the academy can bring a lot to the memory organizations in terms of those benefits. And so this is just to sort of express that there's a whole range of collaboration here and the way those collaborative um, elements may sit together. And in some respects, this is just me being very playful. I haven't, you know, this is, this is me just sort of thinking about this and thinking, well, how would I express this? How would I sort of put these things uh, together in, 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 this, in this environment? So I want to talk briefly about whether... What we're doing in the digital humanities is making an impact or just a splash. Are we really changing anything? And uh, when you hear me talk about, about impact, um, in your mind, erase impact meaning he was on the telly, and erase impact meaning lots of users. Impact means change and change in people's lives. And that's what I mean when I use the phrase. So I'm going to use this phrase throughout, and you'll hopefully pick that, that aspect up as we go through. So I did a, uh, a piece of research for um, one of our funding bodies in the UK called JISC, um, which was called Inspiring Research, Inspiring Scholarship, the Value and Benefits of Digitized Resources for Learning, Teaching, Research, and Enjoyment. And I think that this is an important factor to, to build in here that when we think about what memory organizations are about, when we think about what academic activity is about, for me, it comes down to those three E's of, of, of education, enlightenment, and enjoyment or entertainment. I don't think that that is a, a separate item that should be excluded from this, from this consideration. And so we looked back over the last 15 years of expenditures and said, well, what were the sort of benefits? What sort of value have we seen in the UK and further afield from uh, the digitized resources that have been created over that period. And you'll see, as I go through this, that almost all of these benefits relate back to a digital humanities project in some form or another. So the first one I'd like to, to, to express is the idea of new areas of research being enabled. So our opportunity, as we all know, what makes for a great research project a great research question? What makes for a great digital humanities research project? A great research question that can be answered by a digital mechanism. You know, it's as simple as that. So new areas of research being enabled. And so this example here, which is the old Bailey online, I've seen a couple of people sort of nodding, uh, understanding this. Now, this is a project that I've been involved with right from the beginning when I was uh, at the University of Hertfordshire working with uh, uh, Tim Hitchcock and Bob Shoemaker. And uh, it's, a, it's a really good example of uh, a project which digitized the court transcripts of the Old Bailey. How exciting is that? That doesn't sound very exciting at all. But actually, by going deeper, by thinking early on in the process, who would use these materials? How would they use them? How can we maybe enable ourselves to answer questions from these materials that if all we do is electronic photocopying of them, we won't be able to answer because all we'll be doing is just transposing the problem of having microfilm into having digital. And that would be great, but actually if we can rekey these materials, if we can mark them up, if we can express them in different ways, it was my idea that we would mark up the family history type uh, searches that were there. Um, and it was... Tim and Bob's idea that they should do it at such great depth and that they should enable all this material to be uh, searchable in interesting statistical ways as well. 
so that you can maybe even use you know, the Old Bailey as a, as a, as a, as a sort of uh, silk handkerchief monitor of inflation over a period of time. You know, this sort of searching is available. And as Tim says, the Old Bailey reaches out to communities such as family historians who are keen to find a personal history reflected in a national story, and the process reinforces the working of a civil society. That's a pretty big claim, isn't it? Digital resources both create a new audience and reconfigure our analysis to favor the individual. And I think what we are seeing is that the digital availability of primary sources in history is having that effect of enabling historians to start to tell personal stories and to tell the stories of history from the perspectives of individuals, from the non-elites perspective, shall we say. And so I think that this is quite a a big change that we can see here. And David Turner here talking from Swansea University says that digitized resources allow me to discover the hidden lives of disabled people who have not traditionally left records of their lives. I have found disability was discussed by many writers in the 18th century and that disabled men and women played an important role in the social life of the time. And so you can see here, you know, an opportunity that's come up because of the digital resources, because of our ability to search those resources and because of that individualization of that through personal materials. Effective, efficient, and world-leading. So um, the Jane Austen Fiction Manuscripts Project, which is a collaboration between um, DDH at King's and Oxford University and uh, my good friend Catherine Sutherland. Um, as Catherine says, it offers an unprecedented opportunity for new scholarship, exploring creative no laboratory for novels. Manuscript sources freely available to a wider public. You no longer have to travel to 12 libraries to see these manuscript resources. It has to be said that making these manuscript resources with all the crossings out and the errors in grammar and punctuation, etc., has meant that Catherine is now getting hate mail from members of the public who say, how can you say that my hero didn't write perfectly straight out? But actually... <laughs> That's quite an important thing for people to learn, isn't it? You know, that, you know, um, that, that, uh, that, that, you know, the, this, sort of, this sort of creativity isn't a work of magic. It's a work of really hard work and often is collaborative again uh, in nature. Uh, and a similar example here with the Early English Books Online. There's bringing collections out of the dark. I mean, literally, in this case, out of the closet. This example of medieval music was found in, uh, lining a hat box, um, which, is, uh, which is a bit of fun and also is a nice little commentary on digital preservation. You know, if this was digital, how on earth, you know, lining a hat box wouldn't help us, would it, really, in that sense, like this? Um, and the other piece of music there is, uh, is, has, been, uh, has been eaten. Uh, away, and you know these sorts of collections wouldn 't be seen by your average member of the public actually may not be even seen it seeable by your average scholar uh, without some form of digital engagement to them and Of course, we can do some rather wonderful things as well by doing high high quality um, a high standard of uh, digital imaging. We can look at a piece of music like this, hand this to a musicologist, a specialist with some simple tools. And as you can see, what's happened here is, is that the, uh, the, the acid in the ink has eaten through from one side to the other. And give this to a musicologist with some tools, and we can start to visualize what the music on this side of the page should have looked like uh, in that way. And with thanks to Julia Craig McFeely for this slide. It's also about bestowing economic and community benefits. Let's not pretend that there isn't an economic agenda here. Uh, we worked out that digitized content and the just collections of negotiations saved the sector £43 million pounds per year. I worked out that the crowdsourcing that was done on the National Library of Australia's um, uh, newspaper project was worth 73 person years of effort, like this. You know, these are not insignificant financial activities. It's worth saying that Glasgow Museum's collections is the city's biggest single fiscal asset, valued at 1.4 billion pounds. That's actually, those 1.2 million objects, that's actually a greater value in that museum collection than all of the housing stock, private housing stock in Glasgow. But only about 2% of it is, uh, is on exhibition or display at any given time. You can imagine how the population of Glasgow might feel if you only said they could only live in 2% of the houses at any given time. They wouldn't be so happy. So there's an issue here of civic requirement. If you've got this huge fiscal asset, why isn't it being seen? Why isn't it being used? 
And so they are going to uh, an, open, an open collections environment. They're working on digital access, and they have a very bold strategy. They say that the major impact, the change they are seeking in their community is to increase self-confidence in the population, to make the population feel less marginalized, less insignificant, less unheard, to increase feelings of self-worth through interaction with the museum, and that this will spill over into every aspect of their lives. This is quite a big claim that they are wanting to seek. They are looking for serious and significant community benefits by engaging in this way. Another economic benefit um, from the National Museums of Liverpool, they did a full economic impact assessment in 2008, and they found that in total, the, the, the museums in Liverpool reliably are estimated to be worth £115 million to the local economy in the Liverpool city region, and a spend that supports 2,274 full-time jobs. So all of our institutions have a footprint. We all create wealth within our local communities like this. And this is the sort of wealth that Liverpool have been able to show uh, they, they create within their communities. But coming back to that issue about interdisciplinarity and collaborative and possibly unexpected audiences. So the Freeze Frame Archive, so this project, which is about digitizing uh, historic records of the Antarctic uh, explorations, um, its photographs, its all of the logbooks, the records, all these sorts of materials, um, that has a big historic importance, of course. But it also, and a great you know, geographic and geological importance as well, but it's also invaluable, invaluable in charting the changes in polar regions. And as Penhado says, making the material available to all will help further research into scientific studies around global warming and climate change because it provides a point you can measure from. It's a point of measuring change from. It gives us a baseline. It gives us a place where we can measure from because they were the people there doing this measurement. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of interesting things here. You know, the skins of penguins that they brought back uh, from those, exhibi from those uh, not exhibitions, expeditions even, from those expeditions were tested when the uh, world was worried about the proliferation of DDT. And those skins were tested and found that the skins of the blubber of the skins and those, those penguin skins did not contain any DDT. But if you went and uh, found an unfortunate uh, penguin uh, now and tested it, you would have found, or at the time that DDT was being prevalently used, you'd have found uh, DDT in the blubber of penguins in the Antarctic. And this was used as a means of demonstrating that DDT was, was a man-made uh, uh, event that it was prevalent in the atmosphere because of what man was doing and led to the, 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 the strong reduction in DDT. So one of the things that, that we get from these sorts of projects is unexpected uses, you know, collaborations that happen across subject boundaries that maybe we weren't expecting, and users coming out of the woodwork in ways that we may not have been perceiving as well. But this sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds really good. Sounds like I'm saying, it's all wonderful. Let's do all of this stuff. Isn't it great? Well, I'd like to maybe take us on a journey of the imagination for a moment. I just want you to think, uh, come with me on a, on, on a, on a journey to, to Poland. Uh, let's go to Krakow. Let's take a little journey to Krakow. And for a moment, if you can just allow me to suggest a place I'd like us to be and then see how far away from it we actually are. Okay. So you're in Krakow. You're there as a tourist having some fun. And you decide to visit the uh, Wawel um, Cathedral. Fabulously beautiful uh, ancient cathedral. And as you wander towards the cathedral entrance, your device says, I know you like to have rich interactive experiences because you've told me like this. I'm not going to do this if you tell me you don't want to do this. You know, I'm only going to do this as a matter of choice. And it starts to say, 
would you like to see some content about this cathedral? Would you like to have this content available to you here and now, in this moment, in the context of you being in the presence of this uh, architectural uh, masterpiece, in the presence of this historical space? And as you say, yeah, okay, show me what you've got. Then you find that you get the guidebook. So you get the guidebook in all sorts of different languages. You get a schematic which shows you how you can navigate the museum and see all sorts of different interesting things relating to the interesting people who are buried there. Maybe you also see that there were, hang on, press the button, that there were choral, choral works performed here. And possibly you'd actually like to hear some of those choral works. And as you're listening to that, you look up and you see the ceiling and you think, that's a fabulous ceiling. Isn't that a beautiful ceiling? But actually, I can't see it maybe as clearly as I'd like to. Wouldn't I be able to like to see some of the details of that much more close up on my device? Show me things I can't see so easily in the physical spaces. Wouldn't I like to be able to do all of those things? Wouldn't that enhance my experience quite a lot? And maybe as we wander around, we'd like to know about the kings who are buried there. We may want to see the, uh, the perspectives of the, of the cathedral over time. You know, old photographs, old paintings of the cathedral. We may want to see old floor plans so we can compare what it's like now to what it used to be. Possibly we might want to access newspaper stories that from, uh, from the past that relate to the site that we're in. What about famous people who worked there or who were related to the buildings? And of course, there's lots of artifacts that relate to this place as well, you know, physical material objects that relate to that. And there's more. There's also more digital content, contemporaneous content. There's the 3D model that maybe you want to explore and look at in relationship to that museum. And of course, there's news coverage. So news and film and audio footage that's available about that material. Wouldn't that be great? Can we do it? Will we do this in the next five years? The answer is probably not. And the issue here is not that the content's not available. I found all of this content freely available on the web. None of it did I have to pay for. It was all available. So it's not that I can't sit there at my computer and tap in phrases and go and find this materials. But obviously, these materials were in a number of different places. The problem is not my technology either. I mean, the infrastructure in Poland probably wouldn't hold up for me being able to stream video and those sorts of things like that. But it would hold up in the UK, where we've now got 4G networks with, high, you know, with hyperspeed. It would hold up in many parts of the USA, I'm sure, as well. So what we don't have is a problem which is to do with infrastructure, and we don't have a problem which is to do with content. What do we have a problem with? And you're probably going to say it's about resources. We don't have the money to make this stuff available like this. I argue it's a problem of desire. I argue it's a problem of not having expressed the need and not having attached that need to people and what people want and how people want to engage with our content. And I worry a little bit that a lot of digital humanities projects the, the, I talked earlier um, to the students here um, in the museum program who are doing some fabulous uh, PhD projects. I have to say I want to sort of take some of you home with me. You're doing such a wonderful uh, and interesting activities like this, you know. Um, but um, one of the things I talked about was uh, a project that we engaged with um, at, in the department called Corpus Vitrae Medievi, which is all the medieval stained glass in England and Wales. I want that stained glass information and material to be on my phone when I'm there in the, in the cathedral. I don't want to have to be sat at home typing into a computer to access a complex database which is going to give me uh, information which is fabulously unique and no one else has it. And yet, and it is freely available, and yet I can't have it in the context where it's going to be most meaningful to a group which is wider than just the academic environment. And I think there's, a reason, there's an issue here, which is that we have to make a better case. And the case that we have to make is not one of, there's lots of people using this. The case we have to make is that this is significant to people's lives. 
that it matters to them. Now, in a kind of funny way, um, whenever I come to the States, I, for some reason, always tend to find myself on the plane over listening to the Wichita lineman. Um, it sort of evokes, you know, being away from home, but it also evokes coming to the States for me. And I think there's a line there which is really important when we're thinking about moving forward to thinking about impact. And that line is, is how do we express or how do we get our communities to say, I want you more than need you, and I need you for all time? How do we get that expression and get that built into their, their, their relationship to us and engaging with us? And one of the ways that I think that we can put a better evidence base on the table, that we can show more clearly what we are achieving, is through measuring impact. What has changed and how? And by impact, to be more precise, I mean the measurable outcomes arising from the existence of a digital resource that demonstrate a change in the life or life opportunities of the community. Now, this URL will keep popping up. Um, and uh, you may have spotted that at Simon Tanner is my Twitter account. Um, both of those ways will get you to this, to, this, to this report, which is about measuring the impact of digital resources. And within that, I'm presenting a, uh, a model, uh, a logic model, which enables one to think about balance value impact model. And I'll explain what that means now. So why does impact matter so much? Well, from the one perspective, it's about the fact that we looked at the last 15 years of expenditure in the UK and found that we'd spend £100 million on digitization projects in the UK. We can't let that investment go to waste. And we need to show far more evidence that this is having a change, that it's having an impact than we are at the moment. Because... We do have this issue, which is that just because a resource is being looked at doesn't mean it's having an impact. Just because lots of people have got their eyes on your resource, just because you've got lots of users, doesn't mean you're actually changing things for those people. You don't know the significance of that resource to them unless you're actually starting to go into a deeper, richer method of measuring impact. And curating these questions will help us connect with the past and invent the future, but we need better evidence. And one of the things that anyone who works in a memory organization uh, understands is that digitizing your past content is one problem, but dealing with the data deluge that's being dropped in your lap of born digital material is a whole other problem. And so you ha you're sat in this, this issue where you've got the past and the future both squashing you and causing problems for you. And there's also another issue here, which is that how do we compete in this environment? And I want to talk about the attention economy. And I think this is a real thing, because when we talk about economics, we talk about the distribution of scarce resources. So is this an information age? Well, information is not scarce. Good information, appropriate, uh, authentic information may be not so easy to come by. But actually, we're being deluged. There's a tsunami, if you like, of information, data, um, content that's threatening to crush us. So what actually is the scarce resource in this environment? The scarce resource is our time. It's the one indivisible resource. Think about that for a minute. It doesn't matter how rich you are, you can't make more time. Your 60 seconds is still the same 60 seconds as everyone else. So we, we have an attention economy. I don't mean the sort of attention that Lady Gaga is trying to grab, you know, like this. I mean the ability to attend to something, the ability to spend time, energy, the energy of our communities, the time that they may well give. These things are really valuable. Um, and we're finding that others are monetizing that. When we look at social networks like Facebook, etc. The thing that they're monetizing actually, in a sense, is our attention. It's our time and our energy. There's that old saying, you know, which is that if you're not being charged for a service, you're the product. And this is what we're actually finding in these environments. How are we going to step into those environments? How are we going to promote and preserve our culture 
as an important benefit and show that as an important benefit. Now, I was lucky enough to get funding from the Arcadia Fund uh, to look at this and to engage with the balanced value impact model. Um, and what we found was, look, there's a lot of areas of impact. You know, one of the things that, that frustrates me is, is this, this conception that impact was always economic. You know, it's always about return on investment. And actually what you find is, is that there's many perspectives on this, whether this is about um, political and democratizing um, access or equality and equity or environmental and sustaining or social and community cohesion. There's a number of areas of impact that we can engage with. And there's some tricky aspects in terms of uh, impact as well. You know, we have to understand that if we set out to measure impact, if we set out to measure change in, in people's lives and their communities, some of that impact could be internal. It doesn't always have to happen outside your organization. It could be happening to you in your organization as well, like this. And particularly if we were looking at this from a digital scholarship perspective, it could be what's happening to your scholars, not necessarily to the audience out there. Um, and it could be positive or negative. If you really take it seriously and you measure it, you have to accept that sometimes you're going to get results back that say, actually, you're making things worse, like that. But you can also use it in a predictive way and say, we can use impact as a way of looking at the future and saying, if we do this and this and this and this, would we expect a positive or a negative impact at the other end? So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. So digital resources being used, change occurring, wider set of opportunities available. And the reason I want to put impact into this particular context is that where we tend to find ourselves is that we do an activity, we create some outputs for that activity, we maybe measure the outcome, we never or very rarely get to actually measure impact at this stage here. Um, and so we find ourselves in the situation of, of someone saying, well, um, you know, did you bring your project in on time? Uh, how many objects did you digitize? And that is considered evaluation. But it doesn't tell you anything about impact. That's just telling you about your outputs, like this. And then you're asked questions about, well, what outcomes did you have? How many users have you got? You know, how many people are looking at this stuff like this? And again, you know, this is telling you about outcomes. It's not really getting to the impact question like this, you know. And so... Thinking about impact in that way is quite a, quite a key thing to do. And I'm not pretending that it's particularly easy. Um, and also, we have to remember that that impact comes with a number of perspectives to it uh, in terms of who's benefiting and how they're benefiting. But this example here, which is that let's take the example of health research being carried out. There's an activity there in terms of health research being carried out that creating a research finding being published in papers, the outcome being a change in clinical practice. Actually, that change in clinical practice, that's not impact yet. It's only when we see the improved health and well-being of people at the other end of this process that we're saying that, that that impact is happening. Now, here's an interesting fact for you. When studies have been done in the health um, environment, they found that the period of time between uh, activity and impact on average is about 17 years like that. Now, I found this with research that I've done, which was um, back in 2002, 2003, I did a survey of, of, of American art museums, finding out about their um, digital strategies and their charging models for digital images. And I did this work with the Mellon Foundation, and I presented my research findings in 2004 uh, along, those, along those lines. And there was a lot of interest in that and a number of um, art museums uh, started to say, hey, you know, we're really not making any money out of charging for uh, charging academics and members of the public for access to our images. We really only make money when we charge big business for access to our, our images. Shouldn't we be making more of our images freely available? It took until 2008, 2009 for the Victoria and Albert Museum, the National Gallery... Yale, Harvard, and others to put in place those mechanisms which made available um, uh, very large proportions of their digital images um, free for uh, non-commercial uses uh, in teaching and, 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 uh, and, and publishing. And so suddenly 
that's the point where we start seeing an impact on their communities, you know, of people being economically benefited, educationally benefited in, in terms of those things. So it took a number of years for that to happen. And the only reason that I know that my research actually had that effect was that these people were kind enough to point back to that piece of research and say, this is the evidence base on which we're making this decision. If they all just went off and made those decisions, I might not know that actually I had changed anything at all with my research. And so the, idea, the other aspect of, of impact that I want to engage with for us in the humanities, and particularly in the digital, is this idea that we rush to judgment. That at the end of a project, the last three months or six months after the project, we go, that's the only place where we're making changes. That digital has to be instant. But the humanities doesn't have an instant impact. Why should the digital humanities have an instant impact? The change, you know, we might have instant outcomes, but the changes are going to be more fundamental. Now, I have one other small point to make, and I did promise Anne that I would talk about pornography in this presentation, <laughs> like this. So let's, 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 let's look at this from the perspective of porn. Okay, like this. The Smithsonian has a fabulously important porn collection. Like this. They have intimate videos of pandas having sex. They have a very important, basically, panda porn collection. And the reason it's important is that pandas basically just don't really like doing it, do they? And they're not very good at it. And they're not very good at breeding. And they're not very good at looking after themselves in that, in that context. And they certainly don't like doing it in captivity. And so the activity of recording pandas having sex and then keeping those video recordings for a very long time enables others so these are the video recordings, enables others to use those video recordings to play them back to pandas to hopefully get them in the mood and make them feel frisky. With the hope for outcome that there will be more pandas like this and that we will be able to preserve the panda population by the use of panda porn in this environment like that. Now, is more pandas where the impact happens? Actually, this is something I just want to make a point of here. In my conception of impact here, impact only happens when people are benefited. The fact that there are more pandas in the world, we have to then think, well, how does that uh, ha make a change to people? How does that improve the lives of people? And, of course, we can see that pandas are used as political uh, tools for diplomacy. They're used for economic benefit for zoos. They're used as ways of getting people to take interest in ecology and saving the planet and all those things like that, you know, uh, along, along those lines. But actually, there's a lot of um, uh, nat naturalist, naturalists who are coming to the fore and saying, the amount of money we spend on preserving pandas isn't worth it, because we could preserve an awful lot more species that are endangered. So at the end of the day, the reason why we do this, the reason why the panda porn is so important at the Smithsonian, and the reason why we, we think that preserving and creating more pandas is more important is because of human values, is because we desire it, because we want it more than need it, and we need it for all time, in that sense. This is supposed to be provocative, by the way, because, you know... <laughs> I, I intend to provoke like this. So introducing a new way, the balanced value impact model. So um, what am I talking about here? Well, I'm talking about a way of thinking about, uh, about impact, a way of getting from the point of deciding, well, wouldn't it be really good to know and have a better evidence base to actually being able to demonstrate and deliver that evidence base? And it happens in five um, key stages, context, Analysis and design, implementation, outcomes and results, review and respond. And what I'm going to do in a moment is talk to you about the context layer. I'm not going to go through it all. Uh, we don't have time or the energy. Um, but there's some key questions to ask ourselves, which is, what do I want to assess and why do I want to know this information? 
And once I've got this information, what am I going to do with it? There's very little point in setting out down the route of evidence gathering if you haven't thought about how would I use this evidence at the other end? What is it going to do for me? How is it going to benefit me at the other, at the other end of this activity? And then a really important aspect of impact assessment is when you do get your results, you need to actually feed them back into your process. You don't just sit there and go, look, we've got evidence. You use it. It's part of your process. It helps you to build what you're doing. So within context, we need to know some things. So one of the things that we need to know is uh, we need to know about the ecosystem of the digital resource. Um, and this means, you know, is the thing that we're going to be measuring, is, is the digital resource that we're going to be engaging with, is this a newspaper archive? Is this an archive of, of fine art? Is this, a, is this on mobile phones? Is it only on computers? Is this on an exhibition console in a museum? You know, where, 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 where is it? And we want to know about the stakeholders. Who cares that this thing is being created, used, managed in some way? And then having thought about those things, we want to do our measurement from four perspectives. Because the perspectives here are about making some choices. And the context layer of this, this model is about choice making. Now, the reason that I'm being prescriptive about this is that I wanted to ensure that you create, we create evidence that will uh, naturally fall into a business case at the other end when you've got the evidence gathered. And so, in some respects, what you can say is that by gathering internal impact, you can say, how has this activity made my organization better? How have we benefited? What return on investment have we achieved? What efficiency gain have we achieved? What uh, new ways of working have we engaged with in terms of the innovation impact? What are we doing now that we weren't able to do before? Um, and those sorts of ideas. So how have we, one and two there, how have we been made uh, improved or changed in some way? And then three and four is really about looking externally, so looking outward and saying, how have our community been made richer, more wealthy? How have they been benefited? And what's the social impact? Community cohesion? Sense of place? Sense of worth? How's our social impact being achieved within our community in, in those areas. Now you can imagine that for each of those four perspectives, if you were a museum, you would have a different set of things that you may want to measure than if you were a library or if you were an academic. And so there's a further layer which is about values which I'm going to put on this. But there's one more thing to say about perspectives. The reason for being prescriptive about these perspectives is that there isn't such a thing as an impact which benefits everyone. Okay. And so I'll give you, I'll give you a fun example. So I was talking about um, the Codex Sinaticus from the British Library. So one of the most famous, um, uh, famous books, uh, ancient book, brought together, made digitally available in the British Library, talk about the fact that in the first couple of months they had 20 million visitors. And isn't that fabulous and isn't that wonderful? And I was talking about this and saying, well, how does one think about this? You know, and I was talking to this about an impact uh, expert. And he said, well, put his tongue firmly in his cheek. And he said, you know, while those 20 million people were looking at the Codex Sinaticus online, they weren't shopping. <laughs> so the nation's GDP probably went down. And from an economic impact perspective, there may have been a negative impact. So the point here is, is that perspective matters. You may be able to demonstrate that for your community, your change is benefiting them. But don't assume and don't overstate that just because you're benefiting them, you're therefore benefiting everyone. And that everything you do will always benefit everyone and that no one ever loses like this. You know, there is a relationship there. Like this. Just in the same way that we're making an opportunity cost, an opportunity investment in you being here with me, can't be somewhere else at the same time. Some of you may be wishing you could be. Um, but at the same, you know, those, those sorts of trade-offs, you know, we're always trading. We're always trading time, energy. We're putting these things into, into that aspect. So that's why I wanted to be 
say, look, these are your four perspectives. Understand that you're an organization and that you're going to want to measure these things and that that's okay. You know, don't be afraid of that. But then I wanted to put this into, well, how do you think about these perspectives if you're different types of organizations? So if you are a museum or a library or if you are um, coming at this from the perspective of a, uh, an academic. And I decided that there would be five modes of cultural value that I would like to see applied to those perspectives. Now, these modes of cultural value come out of, you know, sort of standard um, thinking, you know, Bruno and Pomeranian goes back as far as that, you know, in terms of cultural economics and those sorts of aspects. But I've applied them specifically to the, to, to the digital environment. And so I thought about utility value, you know, the value that we get from using something, specifically about using something. The existent prestige value, so that value that a non-user places upon something, which might be about, well, I don't use it, but I value its existence. I mean, anyone who's tried to close down a public library because of its lack of use will suddenly find all these people jumping out of the community saying, look, you can't close that down. It's wonderful. Do you ever use it? No, but it's really important that it's there, like this, because that's, it's there for, you know, uh, maybe retired people. It's there for children, you know. Yes, I may not be using it now, but I want it to be there when I get that to those at, in, in that situation. Right, that's. There's education value, you know, increasing our, our, our knowledge, our understanding, our, that, that which we know. And community value, so our sense of community, our ability to, to, to be part of a community. Maybe the digital is enabling a community to exist in some way. And quite importantly is also the inheritance bequest value. A lot of us have spent an awful lot of time collecting. And so there's an inheritance that is um, implicit within the concept of the digital, digital materials that we're engaging with. But there's also a bequest onto future generations of those things that we are collecting and those things that we are making available digitally. Now, I've tested these five values in a number of different environments. And... The idea here is, is that you take one of your perspectives. So let's say, um, let's, say let's take the, the, the economic one for, for, for sake, of a, sake of argument. And if I was a small community-based museum, then it's likely that I'm going to want to, for the economic impact, I'm going to say, well, my top two values, because I'm not going to measure all these five values because there's too many of them. So let's take two maybe. My top two values that I'm going to want to measure my impact on are going to be about community value and inheritance bequest because I'm a small, locally based um, uh, 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 museum. Um, but if I was coming at this as a national library, I might well say, you know, my economic values are going to be about utility. It's about people using it, and I need to show that we've demonstrated some educational, educational value. And you can see instantly that by taking the perspectives, thinking about the values, you're able to say, I'm this sort of organization, this is this sort of digital resource, therefore I want to measure down this vector. And you can also say, well, I'm this other type of organization, and I want to measure down this vector. So that the model should work for many perspectives and many types of organizations and act as a guide through this process of impact assessment. These are, also, these are also quite a useful tool. I've used this in consultancy with, um, where I've taken this to trustees of a museum where they, where they were disagreeing with the curators and they couldn't work out on a strategy because there seemed to be this big disagreement about what the museum was for and they seemed to be always battling against each other. And in a day we sat down and I said, well, okay, well, here's these five values. Rank them one to five in terms of what you think is most important. I even gave the opportunity, I said, you can discard one of these and add one of your own if you want to. And, I, you know, these are not inviolate. If you want to change them, go ahead, you know, play with them, you know. But the idea of it is that it creates that context layer. And what was really interesting was, was that every single person in, in that environment put education value as either their first or second um, option, but all of the curators put inheritance bequest as either their first or second, and all of the trustees put inheritance bequest as either their fourth or fifth. And so what we were able to do was very quickly say, this is what we agree on, and this is what we don't agree on. And that clarified the ability to build strategy. And it clarified as well 
the opportunity for the trustees to say, oh, I get it, that is really meaningful to you, and actually that's fine, because that's your job, that's what you're there for, you're curators, that's kind of you know, what you're there for, like this. And it enabled the curators to say to the trustees, ah, I get it, you don't think that's that important, but we can see what other things you do think are important, so I understand you better. But what's really nice is we all agree about one thing, at least. So it can be used as a clarifying tool uh, in, uh, in, that, in that sense as well. So to come back to the model, if you work out your context, if you're clear about your perspectives and your values, you feed it into the engine of your balanced value impact model, it means that you'll gain a neatly packaged evidence at the other end where you can say, how have we been made more efficient and effective? How are we better at innovating? How is our community wealthier? How is our community happier? Now that is an impact statement that's going to be hard to argue against. So that's the principle here. I'd also like to give a, a, a shout out to Alice, uh, who uh, did all my illustrations for this. Uh, she's a wonderful artist. So bringing this back to people, I just want to do this very quickly. Um, the Midnight Run. So I said about the Midnight Run at the beginning. Um, so here's Inua. Here's some people from Intellecti Arts. Um, we try to work out a way in which we could do scholarship within the realms of how do you get artists and scholars to work together, you know, uh, and how do we e enable that. And we did, um, I'm suddenly realizing I'm not quite sure, my next, uh, yeah, okay, I'll go back a slide. Um, and so what we did was we came together, and myself, Inua, and David, and we just, none of us knew what we wanted to do. And we said, let's play. Let's be experimental. Let's have ideas. And one of the ideas that came out was, well, could we test my five cultural values in the context of a midnight run? So could we do social experiments within the context of a midnight run? Now, a midnight run is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be you come together at 6 p.m., you go for a walk through London for 12 hours. You're going to eat, you're going to dance, you're going to go on a carousels, you're going to play bag ball, which is a fun game that you play with a bag in an area where it says no ball games. Because um, <laughs> we can do that sort of thing. You're going to have an experience. How do we fit an academic investigation into that experience? How do I get to say, sorry for touching the microphone, uh, how do I get to say that my five modes of cultural value actually are meaningful to anyone outside of the academic community? Is this just something I'm making up, or does this actually resonate with, 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 with people? And so we actually built five um, social experiments along the lines of those five values. So we did an experiment which related to utility, to community, to education, to existence, and to inheritance. And they did this both as playing games, as things like voting with your feet, you know, by going and moving into different areas. And we did this for the first midnight run with a random group of people who came together. And we also did it for a second midnight run, where we gathered the elders, the over 80-year-olds who are part of the Intellecti Arts, and we brought them into two spaces. So we brought them up into King's, into our anatomy theatre, which is a space which has writable walls and a media space, and we did art in that env environment and, and exercise in that environment, and we went to the South Bank, and I'd like to show you the video of this second uh, one.
Now, the videos there were made by an artist called Edwin uh, Mingard, and uh, I think he's done a, a wonderful job of capturing the spirit and the emotion that's, that's behind the Midnight Runs. Um, and what I want to do is, is maybe not talk so much about the Midnight Runs itself, but about the process, because I think there's an important aspect here. It feeds into the, our ideas around what makes digital humanities special in terms of these, these aspects, you know. So it's issues around willingness to learn, you know, willingness to step into someone else's space and to learn from them, you know. I didn't know how to do a midnight run. I have no idea how to get people to want to just turn up and be with me for 12 hours. I, you know, I, that's, that's, that's something that in a way as a performer and a, as an artist, you know, has a, a unique ability to do, you know, and so there was a lot of me learning um, from him in, 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 in that, that activity. It was about, well, how can we be playful, you know, how can we work in ways that aren't our usual background? Um, and, you know, and the starting point was not what project are we doing? We didn't, we never sat down and said, here's my project. And here's the project I'm doing, and here's what this project means. What we did was we sat down and we said, what are we interested in exploring? What matters to us? What are the things that we're engaged with that we, we like to think about and, and question? And that took us on this journey uh, where we decided to engage with the Midnight Run. And to engage with these challenges of how do you insert an academic inquiry into something that's supposed to be fun? And how do you work with an artist so that they can still be creative? So that the academic doesn't impose itself on the artistic in engagement so that they stop being an artist in this, in this space. And so this is all a learning experience for me. This is uh, a learning experience that I'm engaging with at the moment. But I think that it feeds very directly into what the digital humanities should be in terms of our engagement with each other is just the same as engaging with those artists. We need to have that element of being willing to take a risk, being willing to be playful, being willing to learn from the other uh, as we go forward. And when I had the occasional doubt, you know, these exercises that we're doing, we did an education exercise where they were asked to reflect back on their childhood by Inua and to reflect back on moments in their childhood and what they might reflect back on and how they would engage with that and what learning meant to them. And I wondered, you know, how am I going to collate this information? How am I going to make this, you know, useful in terms of relating one set of people to the other set of people and this information that came out? And then we had uh, a poetry session with one of the other artists who came and this reflection came out from someone who said, that's the first time in that room that I've written what I feel, responded to those questions and left it up there for anybody else to read for the first time in the last 10 years. I didn't let myself worry about being judged or whether it was good enough, whatever. I just left it out there and there was some peace that came with that. I just allowed myself to be and I feel enriched. I feel energized by that and empowered by that. And for me, whatever I want to gain as an academic, that person gained that from this process and I was part of that and that's worth being part of that process uh, along the way. Now I do have a couple more slides but we're running out of time so actually I think this is a moment where I would like to just stop and say thank you very much for uh, listening to me uh, talk about these few things from the perspective of digital humanities. Thank you.
Matt. I guess an obvious question I have is, I mean, I really appreciate the way that you, that this asks us to reorient ourselves in terms of value, where educational value is one of many values that could result from a project. But of course, it's one that a lot of people who might be producers of this get judged on professionally. Yeah. So what, on your campus, what sort of interventions have you made with the campus culture or with you know, the, the sort of professional assessment to accommodate those other, you know, those other forms of value uh, you know, to, so that they can matter in people's work? Uh, right now, I'm in the revolutionary phase where I'm the voice shouting this way and um, pointing in a particular direction. Um, it's unlikely that uh, I'm going to be able to change things in the very short term because we're literally in the process of having to do the research assessment exercise, the research evaluation framework. And within that, 20% of the marks is based on impact. But actually, their conception of impact is about public engagement and misses out some of these, 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 these values that I've, that I've talked about. So in the short term, the likelihood is, is that self-preservation for universities is going to mean that, and for my university is going to mean that we're going to, let's just keep going and hit this, hit this, this, this marker, this target that the government set. And I would say, and this, is, this, this was something that I was going to come on, that there are some challenges for us in terms of digital humanities uh, along those lines, which is, um, which is this sort of set of questions that, you know, do we dare ask these questions? And there is this challenge to ask, which is, if we ask our communities what success looks like, would we like the answers? If we, um, if we allowed our beneficiaries to have a say in what the humanities is or should be, would we be willing to change if they said it should be different than what we think it is? Um, but we also need to be careful of this issue of if we measure it, does that change the thing that we measure? Does it change us or them? Because the reality is, is that the target culture that we have in the UK, where I have to present four publications that are at the highest international level to be considered an important academic in my institution, and that I have to demonstrate research is having a particular type of public engagement impact. By revealing the measures and by saying to people, if you achieve those targets, you will get more money, you actually corrupt the very thing that you're trying to measure. And I don't mean corrupt in, a, in, a, in, in the sense of you know, um, uh, encouraging people to do things that are illegal. I mean, corrupt in the sense that the data is no longer meaningful. Um, so if you say that the only measure of academic success is citation analysis, and you keep telling people that, and you keep telling them that is the measure, and you keep measuring and measuring and measuring on that, what you do is you start to corrupt the data set on which you're measuring. And so you, stop, you lose the sense in which it is actually a, then a meaningful indicator um, or you put so many challenges in the way of it being a meaningful indicator that it, it starts to, 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 to corrupt the very thing that it's setting out to measure. And so one of the tricky aspects always in any sort of impact assessment is what is the indicator? And does it, is it actually meaningful when you've measured it? And that remains a challenge to us. And at the moment, um, I think... Where we are institutionally is, yeah, I'm not going to be able to change things in the short term. But I think that I'm hoping that certainly I'm getting reflections back from my community in the UK where they're saying this is quite a fundamental change in thinking and we think it could change the way we perceive these sorts of issues going forward. Um, I've also sat down with funding bodies and uh, it may well be that they will start using the impact model as a guidance document to those seeking funding um, uh, to say, look, you know, we're actually prepared to be here for the slightly longer term to understand that you know, projects don't finish on the last day of the funding. Um, so there, are, you know, there is the hope that I can evangelize enough that there will be a sea change along those lines. Time for probably one more question. Simon, earlier today you had a question from one of the graduate students that I'm sure you get all the time, but I was wondering if you could answer it again for the benefit of this <coughs> audience, and that is for your definition of de digital humanities. My definition of digital humanities. Um, uh, 
uh, is what we just showed you. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of debate about, about this, and you, you will find that, that, that lots of people put different um, definitions on, on, on the table. And fr from my perspective, I'm, I'm not a, um, a fundamentalist for any of those definitions. I like the aspect that um, it can be a wide, a wide church. I think that the digital humanities has provided homes for people like myself who wouldn't find homes in maybe some of the other more traditional um, uh, ap academic subject areas. And so I don't want to be too prescriptive. I know digital humanities when it's happening, so that's great. But for me, um, the, 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 the phrase that I often use that I hope should characterize digital humanities <laughs> relates back to um, Pinizzi and when he was creating the collections at the British Library within the context of the British Museum um, all those years ago. And he said that his collecting principle was that it should be about the useful, the unusual, and the unique. And I think that, for me, that is a really good standard that we should be aiming to achieve, that the digital humanities should be enabling humanities research, which is useful, that is unusual and is unique because of the application of the technology to that humanities research question. And that, that in a sense, sort of gets us to closer to a sense of what would make digital humanities a special thing that's worth adding into the mix of wonderful scholarship that's already being done within the arts and humanities uh, faculties around the world. So that would be where I would sort of start from, maybe. Join me in thanking Simon Tanner for a great talk.